living la vida loca. This show is changing lives. We talking about your diet, trying to get you feeling right. Cut up them avocados, fry some eggs. Time to explore the longest running health podcast, hosted by Jimmy Moore. Time to give up the crappy garbage. We're getting into ketosis. Every day is a new step to your goal. Yeah, you're getting closer. Motivated and focused. Don't stop, just go. Time to get inspiration from the living la vida low carb show. Hey. The Living Low Carb Show Guys, that right there Woo. is Dr. Annette Bosworth, aka Dr. Boz, and she is over on Instagram. She makes it easy to find her, Dr. Boz underscore Annette Bosworth MD, and she is a ketogenic fan, you guys. She's got a wonderful resource. We're going to talk about a little bit here today: Keto Continuum Workbook and uh, how you can be keto for life and sustain it for life. A lot of people struggle with that. So we're going to talk about a lot of those kinds of things today. So Annette, welcome. It is so nice to see you again, Jimmy. Thanks for taking the time to, to select me to be on your show. I really feel like it's a, like this is the grandfather of all keto podcasting and especially the, the art of the way you really have been in this space long enough to know Oh, there's a lot of taglines that go with keto, but there's also some really hardcore uh, course corrections in life that we probably we could all benefit from. Yes, and we'll definitely get into a lot of those things that you deal with with your patients on a daily basis. But first, I want to, to, to talk about how you and I kind of commiserated because I met you uh, in person for the first time at the Keto Fest conference in Connecticut, gosh, that had to have been 2017, 18, somewhere in there. I think it was 17, wasn't it? Yeah. And I, I don't remember. Maybe it was 18. Maybe the it was last 18. two years have made the whole my whole life a blur. So, Amen. <laughs> but I remember sitting down, we were at a restaurant, and you and I talked. We talked for like a couple of hours there, and it was just, it was a wonderful conversation, and I got to know your heart, and you were inquisitive about me. It was kind of a cool little bonding moment that we had there. Uh, at the Keto Fest conference. So I, I never forgot that, by the way. So thank you for giving me time that night. Thank you know, that that uh, journey was the first time I, I was so, this is gonna sound strange, but lonely for other people who knew keto. I mean, I think uh, it had been shortly after I had written the book, the first book, and I was so stinking tired <laughs> of telling yeah. people what a ketone was that it was just the most refreshing thing to be in a tribe of people who not only understand, you know, probably more keto than I did at the time, but were, I just didn't have to start at the beginning again, like, oh, a ketone is a unit of fuel. Yeah. Well, and, <laughs> so, and what's funny is t circa 2017, that's right about the time keto was just starting to really kind of catch on in the culture. Uh, you had Keto Con and Keto Fest, and I had the Low Carb Cruise at the time. I had written Keto Clarity. There were a few little things out there, but not a whole lot. And so you're right. Like at the time, it was kind of, a, and I was a lonely wolf 15, 17 years ago when I first started and got into the low carb space. Dr. Atkins had died. There was really nobody talking about low carb diets right around 2005. And I was just like, I felt all alone for many years. So I know what you're talking about. Mm. You know, I really find that that um, that conference helped me just adjust to several things that happened in the aftermath of that, which was that hunger for like I had been a follower of the two keto dudes. That's yeah. and they were the ones who hosted that. And that's how I ended up there. Hearing names through their podcast is how I think I found you uh, or maybe it was just keto in general. And in the in that satisfaction of again the hunger for other people to talk this way um i just remember feeling okay i'm not so alone going back to my world and just doing my thing again but it was just easier knowing oh there's this universe of people who actually are doing this too and i have found that that same sense of almost arrival and then looking up to see well wait a minute i'm the only one in my family that does this or i'm the only one in my universe that i know that does this that's not quite as rare as it is now, uh, or it was then, but how hungry people are for saying, I just need a unit of people to talk to a little more regularly <laughs> that helped me stay the course. And I just, I really think that that was the turning point for my um, medical office for sure to say, okay, we're going to do this for real. We're going to, we're going to step over the threshold and be that doctor that does keto. And um, in the process, 
I, yeah, all bets are off on how I will, I will survive. Well, and thankfully now we have a nice group of doctors uh, and other medical professionals, nurses, PAs, uh, you can kind of go down the list, um, who understand the value of nutritional ketosis and how it plays a role in healing that goes beyond pharmacology and physiology, which is what you learned in medical school. But let's back up, Annette, for a moment, because... A lot of people may not know who you are. How did you get into keto as a doctor? Tell us your story. What got you interested in medicine? And how did you go from learning mainstream medicine into shifting into more nutritional health as a means of healing your patients? Yeah, I had this incredibly stubborn patient um, that changed my whole practice. She was um, fighting, um, fighting cancer. And she had had chemo a couple of rounds. She was now 71 years old. And it was time for another check of her cancer, the kind of cancer of white blood cells, where the faster the cancer uh, replicates uh, and we measure that, the shorter the life it spans. So we give chemo when it's replicating really fast and when it's built up a bunch of gunk, a bunch of cancer. And the first two rounds of cancer knocked her out of uh, life, like, took her to zombie zone, really took us a couple years to get her back into the, the swing of things. So when she was coming on to her 71st, um, sec, almost her 72nd birthday, uh, she had, was in the clinic, it was time to check things again. I walk, I see her check in and you've got the, the big lymph nodes in her neck that I can see from across the room. It doesn't take a lot to say we're in trouble. She's been on antibiotics, I mean, from my clinic for 50 out of the 52 weeks prior. Life wasn't doing so well, and she looked awful. She looked gray, this is not healthy. So she comes back in, the numbers are terrible. And um, when chemo is offered, she says, not doing it. And she can, she's really stubborn, she's a, quite an ornery woman, and um, I try to plead with her, that doesn't work. And she goes, well, what would you do? And you know, in medicine, there are a few times when a patient trusts you that much yes. that they ask, if you were 71, what would you do? And I had been studying the ketogenic diet for brain health. Uh, that um, There was a podcast between Tim Ferriss and Dr. Um, Dom D Diagostino in yep. the six months prior, and I kind of lost my head thinking, how, is, how are they doing what I do so much faster when it comes to healing brain injuries, especially... I mean, there's concussion, but there was depression and Parkinson's and these really awful disorders that were remarkably improved if they were in a state of ketosis. I knew nothing about it. It was very embarrassing. Like, how can I not know about that? So I, I would, knew just enough about keto to be dangerous, probably. <laughs> and this woman uh, says, what would you do? And I said, the honest answer is I would walk out the front door of that hospital and I would go on a ketogenic diet for six weeks and see what happens. And the patient was my mom. And yeah. so that first book that I wrote was called Any Way You Can, which yeah. is how we were getting through that season of her life. And we came back to that oncologist six weeks later. He thought we went for chemo. The hallway for chemo was there. The front door was there. We drove out the front, went out the front door, drove to the family farm 100 miles away. And that led us to the most incredible blunder of keto <laughs> nutrition because I was not very, yeah, that's what it looks like. Yep. Uh, that's a picture of her before chemo. That's a picture of her grandson kissing her, saying, I don't know how long, many more of these I'm going to get. He didn't say that. She felt that. And in the six weeks we come back, I knew there were some things going right because she um, she got off antibiotic. I mean, she, just, she, kept, she would call whenever there was an infection. And, and your daughter's an internist. You can figure that out pretty quickly. And so we... I didn't have any calls for antibiotics for like the, the four weeks prior to the appointment. So we had been two weeks on to keto and the calls stopped for that. Um, we then, you know, blundered through keto. We really didn't do it great. We didn't lose weight. We just were in keto. We were being on ketone steps, proving ketosis. And when we showed up to the a doctor's oncology visit, they checked the numbers right before the doctor sees them. And we're waiting a really long time, both very nervous. And I had said to her, just if he asks any questions, just, Deny, deny, deny. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. I don't know how to explain this. And I was just praying that her numbers were supposed to double in those six weeks. Um, and then that was expecting her life to only last about six more months. And in that process, um, I was really praying that they had only gone up by 50%. 
but I had no space in my mind to know that her numbers went down by 30%, right. which would have been the same expectations we had for chemotherapy in her yeah. case. And there was no literature about this. This was a really big move. I was like, I am rolling the dice on my mom's life here. Right. When you and I met at Keto Fest, you were going, you were in the thick of it at that point. Mm, and, and this is when I was like terribly, so it had to be 2017. Yeah. Because yeah. the book came out the next year. I was writing little notes to her. And then I lost a bet with my husband who said, you should turn that into a book. <laughs> you should turn that into a book. And I am their stayed wives. married <laughs> by, aunt, by doing that. And it really has. It's, you know, it's, um, you know, a lot more about publishing than I do, but I just self published and thought 12 people would buy it because it was my husband's idea, you know, <laughs> and um, 100,000 copies have been sold. It's just Whoa, amazing. Whoa, of a mm -hmm. self published book. Of wow, self -published well book. done. Right. So, wow. you know, the story is a little bit snarky at the beginning because I was sure as hell convinced this was going to be a fad diet and a bunch of crap. And <laughs> I've seen this before and I know best. I'm a doctor and. Then a whole bunch of humble pie shows up in the next few chapters as I explain what I was learning as fast as I could learn it for the, for the life of my mom. So that's how I got into keto. And uh, thankfully, there were a few grace-filled experts at, that allowed me to just, I don't know, experience how hard it was to transition your mind as the, you know, internists. We write prescriptions. So we right. match diseases to labs to meds, and that's the answer. Well, and what's interesting to me, thank you for sharing that part of your story. And I, I kind of knew bits and pieces of that, but you kind of wrapped it up in a bow for me uh, uh, clearly. Uh, what's amazing to me is what you discovered with your own mom isn't even known within the oncology world. They still oh. poo poo on nutritional ketosis. And I, I get it. There is scant actual studies looking at this from a randomized controlled trial. I know uh, Feynman and Fine did a really cool study with about 12 or 13 cancer patients where they put them on a ketogenic diet. Some of them got better. Some of them saw no progression and some of them got worse. So it's like there's there's inconclusiveness. But if it's a first do no harm kind of thing and it's a nutritional approach, that seems a whole hell of a lot better than just chemo, chemo, chemo. And I hope you don't die soon. Right. You know, it, it's really been, it was, I mean, it was a definite rift in who am I? You know, I'd grown up as a farm kid and uh, people say, why did you want to become a doctor? I said, I really hated hog chores. <laughs> there had to be a better way of life. And so first generation physician, I had this really noble uh, expectations for what these people, you know, those in the white coat did. And for many years, it lived up to all of my expectations. And when I had the choice point of what kind of doctor do you want to be? I was like, good Lord, another life altering decision I have to make now, not really understanding what that, you know, plays forward to the, the answer came from how do you answer the questions my parents and the people I love kept asking me. And I just found this different conversation that the questions they would ask the scripted answers I'm supposed to give in the clinic. And then what would I really do if it was my parents? Right. And I just think, that space is not allowed in a lot of corporations in medicine. You do get peer reviewed. You do get reports at the end of the month saying how many statins were your diabetics on? How well are their A1Cs controlled? And those mean the same thing. What? Well, and, and you're handcuffed by, and a lot of patients don't understand this. Uh, I've talked to so many medical people. I understand it, unfortunately, better than most patients. But a lot of patients don't understand standard of care. kind of dictates what you're allowed to do. And ICD codes, you have to come up with a code that kind of uh, is your protocol. And why are you doing the things that you're doing so you can get reimbursement from insurance? All those things are like the moving parts of the medical system that the average patient is just like, make me better. And the doctor's going, yeah, but I still need to do this. And so it is is a lot more convoluted than people realize. Oh, it's it's profoundly, uh, you know, again, the, the rift in my my person, as I went through, you know, I'd been flown to the White House for top 100 physicians, according to your data, working for underserved patients. I had had a lot of accolades in the world of medicine and really uh, aggressively teaching in the medical schools and doing, taking, you know, medical students to Haiti, doing the kinds of things to say, how do we cultivate the next generation of physicians? And then I've locked horns with the, I mean, judge me by the size of my enemies. Uh, because that, uh, when you say, I'm an independent clinic, 
I am not a corporation. I did that. And I said, no, thank you. I'm not going to do this anymore. Can't do it. And it takes the pay way down. And God bless it when the receptionist kid has an illness because you don't have 40 people lined up that can take it over and do her job. You have to run the clinic with one less person that day unless you overstaff. And then it's cost. I mean, it's really an equation in uh, a family's survival if you're going to be in medicine outside a corporation these days. And then add on to that that if something goes wrong with somebody that's on keto and they say, <laughs> if they post on the world, my doctor is and there's what she did and it's great. You know, that's one thing. But then I had a complication. I passed out while fasting and bonked my head, broke my neck. Those kinds of things actually happen. And then when you're the doctor standing outside of the pack, it's called a peer review where your peers <laughs> review what you did. And they're all like, you're on your own, girl. Well, and the ironic thing, let's not pretend like the traditional way of medicine doesn't have risks where patients have things that go wrong with the protocol they're supposed to do with the standard of care. So they go on a statin medication and they still have a heart attack. But doc, I thought that was supposed to prevent a heart attack. Well, it was supposed to, I guess you have bad genetics and it's just round and round we go the point for the finger pointing at doctors trying to do things for their patients rather than just mm -hmm. the call you're not looking at your patient as a lemming you're looking at them as a human being yeah no no it's real so when when you look at your journey kind of uh, walk me back through where your life has gone since keto um you know that was the two keto dudes so and keto fest um because as you've continued your uh your following is just incredible um uh, so your your sustained journey is something to be praised uh tell me how your keto I mean, are you, are you carnivore? <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, I yeah. So the last four years, so that would have been right after you and I talked about a year later, I decided, you know what? I don't really like vegetables. I just <laughs> carnivore. So I did. I went carnivore um, and put, I mean, not anal retentive about it. Oh, if I eat a vegetable or any kind of plant, I'm going to die. Yes, that no. If I want avocado, I'll eat avocado. If I want mm -hmm. nuts, I'll have nuts. But for the most part, it's animal foods. Uh, I get local uh, grass-fed beef from my local farmer's market. I've got backyard chickens that I get fresh pastured eggs from. I use grass-fed butter in my cooking, obviously spices and salt. Um, that's pretty much my sustenance and has been for four years. I still Annette, deal very much so with adipose tissue in my belly. Um, and so I've done a lot of different biohacking types of things from obviously just basic walking, doing some infrared sauna. I'm currently on an ice bath kick. I don't know if you've seen some of my videos. I did see that. So that's why I was like, oh, I don't want, I kind of scrolled through your stuff going, oh, I got to ask about that. Yes, yes. So I, I'm doing that for five minutes a day in a 32 degree temperature. Like, look, I think the lesson that I try to teach people in my own work, and I know this is something that you try to teach your patients is just stay in the game. And yeah, amen. it's for 18 years and I still learn new things. I feel great. I have lots of energy, my brain health. Like I would not train, trade my brain at 50 years old for all the money in the world to go back to 20 something again. Amen. Right. No. And I, I kind of wish I could go back to school so I could run circles around all those kids. <laughs> <laughs> like from a, from a mindset. I bet you could still I'm do that. Far past what I was even mm -hmm. 10 ago when I had been doing this for a few years. So I'm not where I want to be in my weight, but I am exactly where I want to be in my sleep. My stress is controlled. Mm -hmm. I eat well. Like I think subjectively, those things are devalued in this culture where it's got to be weight loss, weight loss, weight loss. I don't really care about weight loss if I feel good in my own skin. That's huge. You know, again, I got into this space because I'm a I'm an internal medicine doctor and I do bread and butter, diabetes, thyroid, blah, blah, blah. But what really gets me up in the morning to come to the, see patients is when I'm dealing with brain injuries. Yeah. And, you know, one of the big contracts I had that actually just ended right before COVID was Department of Defense asking me to train their counterterrorism leadership on how to heal a brain injury. And, the you know, this wasn't what prescription to write. It was many of the things you just talked about that here's how well it grows in the teenage years. And if you have a head injury, then here's why it matters. But then here are some things that when I take care of, if you're 20 years in the space of head injuries, uh, yes, there's concussions and brain injuries and Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and depression, but there's a lot of addiction. 
And when you're trying to say, how do I help somebody whose behavior keeps undoing what progress we've made? And you can't escape that when the insulin is high, when the, when the body mass index is above that 25, the rate at which their brain ages. And in part because of that chronic inflammatory process that is, you know, the antidote is a state of ketosis. And yes. um, to know that um, when, I, when I started here, um, it was to save my mom's life. And what it has augmented is this opportunity to say, yeah, brain injuries are awful. That your gift of saying my brain is what I really care about and I wouldn't go back to the version of me that was before this. Right. If you are right. That's the most important part of I can fix the leg. We can find a way for the, you know, plenty of those, um, even when lungs and heart and liver don't work right, but the brain isn't working right. That's real. And they come into me saying, Doc, I think I'm glitching on some memory. Yeah. That means we're 10 years in, buddy. That means yeah. we have a whole bunch of debris in the brain. And to reverse that is hard. So having the opportunity to say, yeah, yeah, I know we talk about weight, and that's how you get people through the front door. And I also know that most people who stay consistently keto grow almost all carnivore. I mean, I don't, I don't advertise that word because I think it scares the newbies. Right. Like, what do you mean I'm totally going to give up vegetables? I'm like, okay, just wait. T talk to me in a year. And the whole point is, please tell me you're still trying in a year. Yes. Because if you look at the version of you when you started and then you added an, another little thing you improved and then you added another little thing you improved and now 18 years later, you're pretty good at this diet thing. Yeah. But it's a skill set you acquired by failing and trying again. Right? People ask me, Jimmy, how do you get such good deep sleep? Well, there's a lot of things that I do, but one of the newest things that I recently added is this upgraded magnesium from a company called Upgraded Formulas. Go to their website, upgradedformulas.com, and you can learn all about this nano uh, technology that they use for this particular mineral of magnesium. Again, it's called Upgraded Magnesium, and it's got all the different forms of magnesium in it using the nanotechnology so it gets absorbed a lot better. Guys, I have seen my deep sleep improve by as much as 30 to 40% simply by adding in this product along with sunshine exposure, darkness in the room, cooler temperature, all of the things that I always have done. So again, upgradedformulas.com is the website. Go check them out. And the funny thing is, I didn't have to label any of it. I just did it. And like over time, even when I was still keto, whatever that meant, mm -hmm. um, I was having hamburgers with cheese and that would be all I ate. And my wife at the time would be like, are you going to have any vegetables with that? I'm like, I don't really want them. And, and so I, I, I was drifting towards carnivore before I even knew that's what I was doing. And, and that's really what naturally happens as they get healthier. But to try and shove all that into the, I mean, I'm actually impressed at how well keto has been, you know, my husband, when I was trying to figure out a, a title for the first book, I kept wanting the word keto to be in the front, in the title. He's like, you can't do that. It just sounds fake it sounds either yeah. it sounds so sciencey nobody can understand it or it just sounds awful <laughs> and you know i i hate it when he's right but <laughs> i think he was right well um I, the battle i had with my publisher uh at the time when they came to me and they said hey we want you to write books and what do you want to write about and this is 2012 and i oh, said good lord i said ketogenic diets because i was doing uh uh testing of nutritional ketosis on my blog at the time and I was starting to get some really interesting results. And they're like, yeah, that's kind of a niche. They were into paleo at the time. That's kind of a niche thing. Nobody cares about keto. And I'm like, you're so wrong, but uh, please. And they're like, what else you got? So, uh. so then I was <laughs> well, like, what was your first book? So what's that? What was your first book then? So with them, my first book uh, was Cholesterol Clarity. Oh, right? yeah, cholesterol. right, yeah, yeah. But the problem was cholesterol, the story had been told, Malcolm Kendrick, Johnny Bowden, all these guys had amazing books on cholesterol. I just did the Jimmy version of that same story. Uh, which Readable and relatable to patients, though, so yeah, good yeah. job. And it did pretty well, and I said, please let me write the keto book. And so they finally relented. They're like, okay, but we don't think it's going to do very well. So then this book came out in 2014, Oh, the and, brilliant. Thank you. And this was the first book that ever had the word keto in the title. 
And within one week, that book sold more copies in one week than Cholesterol Clarity had the whole first year. You win. <laughs> and so they were like, you were right. Sorry. <laughs> so, and then, and Hold then, on to know, that. Yeah. Thing a few years later, at like the Keto Fest conference and KetoCon, all the things. And, um, and now we're starting to see kind of keto wane. And everybody's like, what's the next trend? And I'm like, no, I think the next trend is just find what works for you and do that. And I think you're right. I think there's a huge prospect prospect for having people in the world Hi, of keto. And then yeah, that's one of my assistants uh, uh, coming back for lunch. Um, the, but the problem of having a um, a course of uh, of somebody who starts out with these insane goals, like right now you can Google keto and say, you should lose 150 pounds. Yeah. And I'm like, no, 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 no. You just got to start with an, enough rules uh, of improving that chemistry and that first little step. But if you think about you and I, that, that was so many years ago, reminding ourselves that that's where the average person still starts is really worth uh, remembering and appreciating, oh, you're going to be a while. I shouldn't deliver all this in two sentences. So, Annette, I want to run something by you because I've been getting away from explicitly saying keto or ketosis or ketogenic. I think it's become kind of blasé. It's almost been bastardized and co-opted by our culture. I like the concept of low insulin diet. So whatever that means for you, some of you are more insulin uh, resistant. And so low insulin diet is going to be a little bit different than someone who's more insulin sensitive. And it doesn't put any kind of food value on it. It's like what works for you. And so what do you think about my idea of low insulin diet? Uh, I think it, it, it plays right into any physician who's watching, who, who's watching someone on a ketogenic journey. I mean, what is it about the cholesterol? What is it about the brain? And what is it about those heart risks that we're really trying to impact with the guidelines? And it is to remove inflammation and to have the patient reverse some of this insulin resistance. You can find the studies that say it's not reversible, can't do it. That's not true. It's, but you can't reverse it with three square meals a day. You cannot. Uh, right. I mean, yeah. So one of, you know, one of the, um, you know, when Any Way You Can came out, again, praise God for my husband that I did that. <laughs> and then, uh, I, I, so the book came out, um, and I had this woman who, um, it's South Dakota. I'm picking up my son from middle school. It's freezing out. The windows are frozen closed. And somebody's pounding on the window uh, saying, and then he, she holds the book up to the window and says, did you write this? Wow. I'm like, um, get in. <laughs> I can't roll the window down. He gets in the chair and she's like, do you know what they fed me at the hospital? I'm like, back up. Why were you at the hospital? So she had colon cancer. They removed the colon cancer. And during the colon cancer hospitalization, she was fed pudding. And she was reading my book at the time. And so she's begging to become my patient. And I'm like, my staff will kill me if I had one more patient to this right now. I have too many right now. And she goes, well, then you need to start a class, and I'm going to be your first student. <laughs> so this keto support group started, and it was literally the, the basement of my office hadn't been rented out. And there were some folding chairs. The heat wasn't turned on for, I think, the first six meetings. And we just sat around for an hour and did a check-in of a support group on how to be keto and answer the questions. I did it as a free support to my community. And it really did um, help me grow confident that I could transform my medical clinic into a keto clinic. You know, and, I, and I say keto, go ahead. I was going to say, Dr. Westman in Durham, North Carolina, did the same thing. Eric has been doing low-carb support group meetings in Durham and the Triangle area of North Carolina for, gosh, I, I remember speaking at his thing over 10 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> been doing it a long time. He kind of set the model, and he gets a good amount of people. Well, pre-COVID he did. I don't know how it is now. But before that, he was getting like 50, 60 people every meeting once a month. Well, he is another one of those that I met at that same Keto Fest where I just was like, oh, thank you. Thanks for having the title of internal medicine. Thanks for having the uh, status of being from Duke University. Is that right? Duke. Yeah, Duke. Yeah. And uh, thanks for having papers behind what you've done because I'm on this space and I feel very fragile about where I'm about to go that if I don't have resources to, to talk about or to, to reference, I'm going to be in big trouble. And I'll tell you, he shared that idea that must have been in one of his talks that, that yeah. conference that I'm like, 
well, that is brilliant. That is actually yeah. what I do with my other patients because this carb stuff is just as addicting as the booze. And when you look at brain injuries and addiction, I've been, I've been doing that for 10 years. And that process of, I want you to actually have the outcomes that I care about. And that means you're going to have to be in a group and deal with some social things that there is no prescription for. You learn them in a group and you need feedback in a group. Yeah. One, one, thing, so else, as, one thing else that you picked up from Eric uh, Westman is you do videos. Like I love watching you interacting with patients on video. Mm. Well, you're a very warm person. I think people can see that here today. Uh, and I can tell you guys, I've met her in person. She's exactly the same way. You're legit, Dr. Boss. So, uh, but that's the thing, like you, you got on video and they're well produced. I don't know who does those for you, but you, you do such a great job. Well, thank you for that. You know, there's been a learning curve. I, again, uh, as, as I'll go back to your insulin one to tie the videos and insulin together where the, the steps of showing people how to measure their insulin Yep, I can order that in your lab and we can get it covered by well, sometimes obesity, sometimes metabolic syndrome. It wasn't as easy in 2015, 16. Okay, now it's a little easier. I can get it covered usually, but it's still 75 bucks if you have to pay for it yourself. Yes. And then they're going to regulate how often I can check it. So the right thing to do is check your insulin several times a day. How did you respond to that meal? I would love an insulin, you know, continuous meter. <laughs> okay, there's what? not such a thing. Let's yeah. get a let's get an at home one, and I'm all like, that's going to be a multi billion, if not almost trillion dollar idea when they finally can figure that out. I talked to uh, who was it that I talked to, uh, Ben Bigman, and I said, Oh yes, he's great. He's working on that technology. He said, Jimmy, it's going to be hard because you got to spin the blood, and I don't know how mm -hmm. you with an at home. Drug. Right. So sometimes in medicine, the best answer, at least the best answer in a current season is to measure what the drug does, that measure the, the next molecule in line for what either influences insulin or insulin influences. And those two molecules are your blood glucose and yeah. your blood ketones. Yes. And so when you look at a GKI or glucose ketone index, and in, in any way you can, my mom's brain was not working well. She, you know, later into the book, she gets into quite a crisis and we have to make some serious decisions. And I was trying to get her to calculate a GKI and get those melomoles over and shift and do all the math that it takes. And she's like, this is ridiculous. I'm not doing it. I'm like, okay, mom, take the big number, the one that's glucose and divide by the little one. Right. And we called it, I didn't call it this, but I was doing that. And it got called the Dr. Boz ratio. And I called it a ratio at first in the first book. And by the second time I'm trying to really run a clinic, I'm now saying, okay, here's what the Dr. Boz ratio needs to be in order for your GKI to be X, Y, Z and what we were chasing. And I really find that there's been several studies out there that do look at continuous, you know, they look at the insulin inside a, and it is a very high correlation that the better that Dr. Boz ratio gets or the better the GKI gets, yeah. that the better the insulin gets. And when I look at people who they get on the keto diet and they have that first wave of ketones and they're in this, you know, euphoria zone and weight's coming off or they're feeling good, but then they stall. That's when their metabolism has equilibrated to what they are now. And we need to pulse your metabolism again. And how can, I how can I predict who that's going to be? That Dr. Boss ratio drifts up above 100 or at least above 80. And, and I can see that the stall is coming. Uh, and I think that's been the beauty of when I took the first book, which um, I, I get, you know, more than 12 people have bought it. And now I have people trying to come into my clinic even more than the lady pounded on the window. I'm inviting them all to the free support group but they still want to become my patient. And I've yeah. decided the ones I said yes to that didn't know what a ketone was, it was insane. It was awful. They wanted so much of my time. I, I mean, they wanted like three hours. And I tend to want to satisfy patients when they come to see me. And I'm just like, I, the hunger is too much. I can't do it. So I started taking the chapters. Any way you can is really like 70% story and 30% science. So I yeah. was taking those science parts and I just said, okay, you can't come in until you watch this playlist on YouTube that tells you about a ketone. Because if you don't know what a ketone is, I'm starting at the beginning. It's too much. I can't do it. Oh, um, I, I used to lead this conference, the Low Carb Cruise Conference, and people would come on. And I assume if you came on a low carb cruise and you know about Jimmy Moore and my books, that you would know what keto is. And I remember somebody, one of the very first speakers, he's up there, keto, 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 talking about it. And somebody pulls me and says, what's a keto? I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> like, wow, I didn't even think I'd have to explain that on a low-carb cruise. 
Right, right. Well, I think that that's the part where I said, all right, we are going to fix this. We're going to put this on YouTube. And then those, you know, it, it really, it hit at a time where timing hit something and the YouTube channel took off. And then it became, um, you know, a place where talking to a screen, I don't like it. <laughs> I like a human. And so when I would have, I had an opportunity to partner with somebody who was on Facebook and we would do, I just saw, called them the Sunday night consults and I would consult them through their journey very similar to what I was doing in my clinic and I realized that there was a lot that was left on the cutting room floor from that first book of what are the things that I really do oh yes yes uh, and those uh, improvements in the keto continuum uh, or in the clinic I, I kept saying which what are what do patients do that succeed yes. and when uh, I was able to say oh that success rate uh, transferred from um, a small population in my clinic and I wrote down what is the continuum for change that needs to happen as you march through your keto journey and really that that's where the keto continuum came from which is a book yeah there you go and, and it counts the workbook these are the these are the handouts that I would use in my clinic so I, I tell patients even if you only want to buy one book the keto uh, workbook page by page march through it you know, the first half of the book is really getting through the first two weeks. And then that second half is how do you stay consistently keto? And, you know, that um, that march into time-restricted eating, that march into when should you add a fast? Um, and do you ever need to add a fast? I mean, not everybody needs to if their health is doing well enough. I just did a fast for just over six days. So I started Sunday a week ago as of the recording of this. And I got all the way to uh, the sixth day. And within three hours after the sixth day, I got kind of woozy and kind of blacked out a little bit. And I was like, okay. Oh, really? Oh, no, I need to eat something. But six days. Okay, okay, okay. So, so hold on. It, you got to day six, huh? One more time. It was, it was, that was on day six? Well, I had just finished day six and went into day seven, three hours into day seven when that happened. Oh, wow. And I've done many long fasts before, Annette. I've done 21-day fasts several times. As you know, I wrote a book with Dr. Fung about this. Subject. Right. So uh, I know what I'm doing when it comes to fasting. I know how to hydrate well and get plenty of salt and electrolytes. But And that's the first time that's ever happened. I was just like, whoa. I, I how just, long ago was that? A couple of days ago. Oh, really? Wow. So I'll tell you, that is what pushed me to the, the model that I use. And again, I have a local support group that um, in South, Sioux Falls, but I've recently moved to Tampa. Today was the sixth support group in Tampa. But it is where I've, um, because so many people take the advice and literally follow it. <laughs> I've, I've said the longest you should ever fast on this model is 72 hours. You should start it from a state of advanced ketosis if you're doing this, if you're doing the best. Yes. And by advanced, I mean that they're keto adapted. It's not your second week into keto. You've been doing this for a good three or four months. And then um, we don't use the word fasting minus 36 hours. 36 hours is your first fast. That's where the really that growth hormone can start to burst. Um, there's some evidence it can help. It, it can rise in healthy patients when they're keto. But I most people are not healthy. They need help. Uh, and so looking at what is the ultimate challenge in in the progress of watching these numbers and watching what happens in the more, you know, in somebody who's trying to still lose that weight to trying to clean up the, you know, the debris in their brain for better mental focus for less chances of dementia and Alzheimer's. That autophagy goal is uh, that eight consecutive weeks. This is the ultimate goal: uh, eight consecutive weeks of 72 hours fasted, and then on their eating days they have their eating window. And there's some specific rules. This isn't just the general. Your eating window it needs to be as tight as it was before you started. And that means that outside that eating window, it is black coffee and, and water and salt, not your nuts and keto snacks and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so yeah. I, I've had that complication before is what I'm trying to tell you. Well, <laughs> so and what I'm saying is I've done many since 20... Shoot, I've been fasting since 2011, but really serious when I was preparing for that book with Dr. Fung. But I've done many long fasts. I've never had that issue before. 
maybe I didn't hydrate enough. Uh, I had just gotten out of the hot tub, so that probably mm -hmm. had some impact on it as well. But the problem was, the irony of it was, I was in the hot tub to stay chill and relaxed because all the other fasts that I didn't do well, it was my stress levels being up that caused me not to do well and get hungry and have to end the fast. So how ironic was it that one of my stress relieving tactics might have been the culprit in me ending this fast. <laughs> Did you go keto and thought you had to give up wine? Well, let me introduce you to Dry Farm Wines. It is the world's first sugar-free alcohol that is lower than your typical wines. Organic made at local farms that do it the right way. Most of the wines that you buy are from three really big companies loaded with additives and preservatives, so many dozens of those kinds of things. You don't want all that junk in your wine. So go to dryfarmwines.com slash Jimmy and they will ship you these wines. And just because you listen to this podcast, Dry Farm Wines is going to give you a bottle in your first order for just one cent. Go to dryfarmwines.com slash Jimmy and uh, you will get your bottle of wine for just one singular penny. Go check them out. Dry Farm Wines, you guys. It's wine o'clock somewhere. Let's go get some wine. How the how the cold ice baths have helped your stress. Is oh. that one of the reasons you're doing it? Oh, and for sleep um, is the other reason mm -hmm. I'm doing it. Um, and obviously inflammation lowering, insulin sensitivity. It also boosts ketogenesis. Like there's a lot of reasons why I do it. Oh yeah, that. absolutely. Like you just get people to do it is the hard part. Well, the thing is, the thing I've been teaching people is work your way up. Like I started in my bathroom three years ago. I'd take my hot shower and at the end I'd turn it down to warm. And then after a couple of weeks of warm and I'm okay, that's not so bad. I'd go a little cooler and then just slowly a little cooler, a little cooler, a little cooler. And then I learned mm -hmm. to breathe so I can get through it because it is a shock. But once you start doing that and then you kind of put ice uh, in a bathtub and you kind of like, okay, this is, this is cool. When I found myself in the bathtub with a bag of ice for an hour, Annette, I was like, all right, I got to step up my game because apparently this is not challenging me anymore. And that's when I found the Morosco Forge. It's a company and it's a really expensive premium unit. But man, I can just pop in there. It's 32 degrees at any given moment, I want to pop in there. It filtrates the water. It makes its own ice. It's it's very convenient. But I it's love like it. you've moved to Finland. Well, it, it's amazing. <laughs> yes, I see all the people that jump into like natural lakes and things. I'm just like, I want to do that. I want to cut through because <laughs> it's it. You get addicted to it. There's like an endorphin release, and it's very mm -hmm. much like uh, adapting to ketosis. You adapt your body to get used to limiting carbohydrates and subsiding on fat and protein. Well, the same thing with cold. You've got to mm -hmm. adapt yourself to it. But once you do, then you're like, I don't want to stop. And and my my uh, Ura ring tells me my deep oh, great. sleep and my REM mm -hmm. have gone way up. I consistently get well over four hours of combined REM and deep, which is amazing. Uh, with like six hours total sleep. I don't sleep long because hashtag ketosis, you don't need a lot of sleep when you, have you seen this with your patients that when they're in a really good deep state of, state of ketosis, they don't need as much sleep? Uh, well, I push back on that. Uh, okay. So when you look at the, when you look at the repair rates uh, for, for people who've had either a brain injury or, um, and I would call anybody who's been overweight has, has a brain injury they just don't know about. So okay. I'm careful to say that. In fact, on social media, it gets me nervous. Like, oh, I probably shouldn't use that word. But they've had, they're at risk. Let's put it that way. They're yep. at risk for the, uh, the higher um, cellular debris, cellular turnover in the brain that doesn't get swept away. And we know that there is a, uh, I teach it as a dishwasher effect when you sleep that does uh, wash away that protein that does jiggle it away and then clean it up. The macrophages come in and do their job. And we know that the rate that you clear the debris is related to the length of solid sleep. So I have a lot of people push back, oh, you don't need as much sleep in your older years. You don't. And I'm like, if you want to study the brains that had the highest autopsy reports of lack of neural fibril tangles, lack of cancer cells in their body, um, their dishwasher was doing a cycle two or three times a night. Yeah. It, it is a timer thing. You can't, you, you have to have the seven and a half to eight hours. And that's the human part of it. Right. Um, so when, when I look at some of the training tools I use, that's a huge part of the brains course that I did for Department of Defense. And 
Um, and again, I didn't want to talk about any prescriptions in that course because I wanted to say, oh, the prescriptions are like the top 2% of people. What you really need are some of these rules of how to understand what a brain does and how to heal it. And, and when it's injured, it just it's a slower progress. And then you add ketones, and it is a faster process, but it's still a slow process. But I mean, when I listened to Tim Ferriss um, and uh, Dom Diagostino, what was taking me like six years uh, of really good performance in the medical side and the patient's support system of brain repair, I mean, they were getting done in 18 months. And that's remarkable. That is remarkable speed. So when I look at some of the tools that, um, have you ever looked into the Muse headband, M-U-S-E headband? Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I used yeah, to. Yeah. yeah. Do you? Okay, yeah. That's my favorite for saying, I'm going to see how you do. <laughs> Whenever I would, when I would do a check-in for my addiction right. patients, they had two options they could choose. They could do a one-minute jump rope. Um, and I wanted to see what, how many times they could get over the jump rope. The nurse would do their vitals and then, okay, which one do you want? Do you want your Muse headband? Because uh, you could sanitize the headband, hook it up to their phone, and they could meditate for those three to five minutes, whatever they picked, and how many birds <laughs> could you collect in the three to five minutes? How well could you control your brain to slow right. down? And, you know, that being the skill that also helps us shut down at night and really give us a higher level of sleep. I think Aura Ring and Muse are the only two companies out there that really track uh, it's not quite as good as an EEG, but it's as close as our um, home care can get. Uh, and it does a pretty good job of correlating to deep sleep. So what does your aura ring say that you sleep for deep sleep? Um, about two and a half to three hours a night is what mm -hmm. I get. And then the REM is about one and a half to two hours a night. Uh, I'm going to blow your mind one more time. And I actually read an article about this recently. Uh, so I'm going to get your idea. But I actually sleep in segments. I go to sleep two hours after the ice bath. I have some magnesium uh, a couple hours before bedtime. That helps as well. I do a lot of sleep hygiene types of things. CBD oil. I get sunshine during the daytime. I turn the lights down. I don't eat within four hours of sleep. All the things. Um, cold, cold temperature in the sleeping area. Dark, blah, blah, blah. Um, I sleep and I get up about four hours later. And then I'm up for three to four hours, and then I go back to sleep for another two to three hours. And that's been my sleep pattern for a half a year. Um, and I found an article in The Atlantic the other day about segmented sleeping being the norm back in medieval times, that they would, they would literally call it first sleep and second sleep, that in modern society, we're the ones that came up with this construct of a continuous sleep. And so I don't know if my body is going medieval on me and I'm going back to kind of some of my roots because uh, I have Irish background. So maybe a little by roots. Are kind of, I, I don't know. But it's, it's fascinating that there can be bio individuality there. So I, I appreciate the pushback, by the way, on what your experience is with that. But I wonder if it's across the board or if there are exceptions. Well, so some of the literature that I, um, so I haven't read that study, but I, I don't, I have heard of segmented sleep in, um, you know, especially that nomadic uh, journeys where you had uh, essentially shift workers who were watching your tribe. Um, when, when you look at um, what happens between those sleep times, what do you do during those four hours? Oh, I just, I go chill out in the hot tub. Um, I'll sometimes play some word games. I do stuff that's active. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't like turn on bunches of lights and make, play lots of music. And sometimes I, I, I do some of my work, but it's like real low key stuff. I'm not trying mm -hmm. to hype myself up. I'm trying to say, okay, body, when you start getting heavy again, I'll go back upstairs. And usually mm -hmm. it's about three to four hours, most of the time closer to three hours. So I'll be up at say 1230 and by 330, I'm back in the bed again. Well, so one of the things that I would look into is that when a patient's struggling with a continuous sleep process, there's almost always a higher level of cortisol in their life and, and body. So you've had, you take on a million things. So, and I do too. So I, I you are my people. I can tell you. Uh, I care about this a lot. So I can tell you my life is a lot less chaotic and, and stressful and cortisol raising than it was circa like the last couple of years. And I'm not even talking about all the things in the world, just I had something happening in my personal life. And so, no, I'm in a much better place. And this is when it kicked in. When that personal life issue finally calmed down, that's when this pattern of sleep happened. 
Now, how weird mm. is that? I was sleeping throughout the night, all during the very stressful thing I was going through in my personal life. And once that went away and I started feeling less stressed is when this new pattern of sleep developed. Well, I, I would love to, to have you just, I mean, you have access to labs. I, I've seen somebody's ordering for you or you're ordering for yourself, whatever. Uh, the the um, to study at that cortisol response yes. to look at some of those um, long term. Uh, can you lower that uh, the nadir for where your corn, your cortisol hangs out? I, I think in you look at childhood studies of um, um, high scores. They're called ACEs scores yeah. where they've had childhood trauma, and then you just look at how easy it is for their body to overproduce cortisol for a lifetime. Um, and then studying what, I mean, obviously those are all the insulin related diseases that will kind of accrue and um, knowing that um, to help that brain heal, um, it really has, uh, there's a correlation to as we improve the health of the body, the cortisol levels got a little better. And, you know, they're human, so they do things that like don't stay in the study and they don't, <laughs> they don't ha stay away from the stressful things or, you know, there's more trauma in their life. But um, in general, when we would see them start to improve, that cortisol really did get better and the length of their sleep did get better. So I don't know that I have a, a you know, obviously no stamp fits perfectly on every uh, mold of human. Welcome to the practice of medicine. Um, but looking at that um, trend to say, I would, I would love to see the first stretch of your sleep to get to the sixth hour, knowing that that's going to be two of those really cycle of washes. So, you know, following, um, uh, following that, um, you know, you know, where does, you know, in, in your second chapter of sleep, yeah. how well does that dealt, I mean, where do you get most of your, your slow wave sleep at the first session or the second session? I get a ton of deep sleep in the first session and then mm -hmm. I get more, uh, REM in the second session, which if when I was sleeping continuously, that was kind of the way it worked as well, that I would have the first part of the night more deep, and then the second part of the night, I'd see more of the REM. And so, but it kind of evens out of about two and a half for the deep, about one and a half for the REM, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less with both of those, but that's generally what it is. I mean, I would I would think that if it was causing me harm, or if it was less than optimal, that that would catch up to me in some way. Physiologically, I would feel that. Mentally, I would feel that. But I feel great, and I'm full of energy all the time. And it's like, uh, thank you, ketones. But also, thank you, good rest, at least the rest that I do get. Now, I could force myself in it to stay in the bed a little longer, maybe try to force it in the middle of the night when I'm awake to try to stay there. But it's like, I would rather get up, be productive, get some things done, peace of mind, go back to sleep, and then wake up and already have half my day done. Well, if I was your doctor, I would tell you to keep using your aura ring because I think if you're, you're studying yourself, which is really one of the best ways to – the subtext for every one of the clinics I've run is they're usually addicted to something. Don't let them get addicted to us. We are the place to set you free. So uh, that continue to study yourself that way, that's a huge part of um, – um, the, your journey. I would have you look at your morning uh, ketone glucose numbers when you wake up from the first cycle and then look again at the second cycle, knowing that that's a reflection of cortisol and insulin uh, playing with each other. Yeah, so yeah, the, checking uh, those would be a, another fun data point to look at. Yes. And then I would restrict you from doing any electronics between the sleeps, uh, just knowing that that repair is so important for, I mean, let that be the time where you read a book or you um, you, you know, I love uh, I love helping my patients write in cursive. Uh, there's a very uh, there's a lot of literature on what happens when a cursive uh, handwriting is what they use I'm to old soothe themselves. So remember when we had to actually have to do that? We didn't have all these electronics. <laughs> right? No, no, no. I have three sons, which they think I was the worst mom ever when, when I showed up in third grade, saying, "If you're not going to teach cursive, I will, yes. and you will not scold my son for sh for terrible handwriting." Uh, while he's learning cursive, because this is a huge part of the mental shutdown of what we are yeah. really programmed to use, which is a linear connection of our letters. Um, anyway, another neuroscience thing that I love to just say, using some of those places where when patients are trying to detoxify and with it, we all live in this world that is very hyper-scheduled, I'm definitely a product of that. 
uh, and have really had to push back saying, here's the places where I can push hard and there's the places I just have to say no in a place that is good for me. And then as I've uh, tried to give, take the advice I give, uh, knowing that when I've got those cycles of time where I just, the sleep gets me, um, the, the, I can, I, I always have energy when I'm awake, but um, it's in that section. Can I get the brain back to doing another cycle of that dishwasher washing that, that really important dilation um, of that cerebral spinal fluid through those little canals and really is important for the dementia predictions. Uh, so you'll know you're getting there by the morning fasting numbers. Um, and in your case, I would look at both of those uh, okay. in between those. And, you know, the, the other, I mean, you, you write plenty of books. I'm assuming you write with your 10 fingers, not a pencil though, right? Yeah, me too. <laughs> so I couldn't tell you to do some writing then, but you could do some, uh, you could do some reading and some reflecting and those would all be good ideas. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And this turned into more brain health than uh, keto sustainability, but I didn't mind that. I don't mind. <laughs> me up. either. Uh, guys, no, it's great. Dr. Annette Bosworth, go check her out her book, Keto Continuum. And this is the workbook. Uh, lots of great information in there about how to become consistently keto. It's got uh, tips on how to get through the first week, becoming keto adapted, you know, kind of getting your baseline metabolism going, and then fasting as well. You've got a lot of uh, great stuff. So thank you for sending me a copy of that. And go follow her over on Instagram, Dr. Boz underscore Annette Bosworth, MD. And Annette, it's been far too long, my dear, since we last talked. Mm. Glad we got to get you here. So just out of curiosity, are you going into any of the major real people things for keto this next year? Girl, I am so dying. I have not been to a keto <laughs> event since August of 2019. I, I led an event in Canada and I, I went to a couple of biohacking ones last year. I'm hoping maybe Keto Con I would go to, uh, and maybe even Paleo FX, uh, which is in the same venue as Keto Con. Uh, I don't want to get on a plane because it's weird right now in the world. So if I can drive there, I can go there. So that's kind of. So I can't thing. remember. You're, you're not. In, so Keto Con is in Texas, right? Yes. Okay. Are you in Texas? Sa South Carolina. Oh, that's right. I'm not going to. So, but you consider that drivable? Oh, yeah, I can get there in a couple of days. You don't have teenagers anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have no kid. I've never had kids. And so. Oh, well, then let me tell you. Uh, I would have to have a couple of suitcases with the kids in them to do that drive these days. And, and, uh, and some tequila in there as well. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Well, I will be at KetoCon, so if you come, I would love to connect, and we could probably do another podcast then. I mean, yes, I don't know if you do yes. that. Live. You're owed a big hug uh, when I see you next time, but uh, thank I you would so love it. Time to get inspiration from the Living La Vida Low Carb Show. Hey, the Living Low Carb Show dot com. Have you experienced the dreaded keto flu? Did you know that most of these symptoms are actually due to your body dumping excess electrolytes? This is where Element comes in. Element is a tasty electrolyte drink mix with everything you need and nothing you don't. That means lots of salt with no sugar. Element is formulated to help anyone with their electrolyte needs and is perfectly suited to folks following a keto, low carb, or paleo diet. Element contains a science-backed electrolyte ratio, 1,000 milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams potassium, and 60 milligrams of magnesium with none of the junk no sugar no coloring no artificial ingredients no gluten no fillers no bs everyone needs electrolytes especially those on low carb diets or if you practice intermittent or extended fasting if you're physically active or sweat a lot add element today and see how much better you feel and perform Use the URL drinklmnt.com slash Jimmy. Tired of playing the mask game? Me too. That's why I wanted to tell you about the Unmask. This is a breathable, completely breathable. It covers, you can't even see that it's breathable, but it's breathable. Whether you're going on a plane, or having to go into a store and wearing this thing, playthemaskgame.com is how you can get this mask. They come in all kinds of colors and everything. In fact, right there, you can see right through it what it is, but when you're wearing it, it does not look like it's anything different, but it's breathable, baby. Playthemaskgame.com.